the emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom makes clear that the planetary model is not a good description of reality for the hydrogen atom. So we need a new description that is hopefully a little more deep. Hopefully one from which we can actually derive the frequencies of light emitted or absorbed by the hydrogen atom. We can actually do that using a quantum mechanical treatment. And in this video, we're going to introduce the quantum mechanical description of the hydrogen atom. And from here on out, we're going to understand electrons in atoms and molecules using quantum mechanics. And so understanding these foundations for the hydrogen atom in very simple systems is pretty important. You're going to see these ideas come back again and again. The core question here is why? Why are the allowed energies of the hydrogen atom and all others, if we looked at all the other emission spectra of the elements, they too have only discrete wavelengths. Why is this? Why does the Rydberg equation work the way it does? Well, the insight of Erwin Schrödinger, who was one of the early developers of quantum mechanics, was that matter acts like waves. It had been demonstrated that light can act like a particle, so Schrödinger and others asked the question, why can't matter act like a wave? In doing so, he developed an equation that essentially said there is a function called the wave function that we can ascribe to every system that has wave-like behavior. This equation has come to be known as the Schrodinger equation, and in particular, the Schrodinger equation says that if you have a term for the kinetic energy and you add to that a term for the potential energy, that must be equal to the total energy. When you, we take the kinetic and potential together, that's called the Hamiltonian, that must be equal to the total energy times the wave function on the right-hand side. And to make a very long story very short, when the potential is not zero everywhere, only certain energies and corresponding wave functions are actually solutions to Schrodinger's equation. And note that the, this may be an infinite set of possible size, possible wave functions, and corresponding energies. So Schrodinger's idea was that this is a fundamental equation that all physical systems must obey. The hydrogen atom is a physical system, and in fact, if we think of this V as the potential energy, and we use the Coulombic model we've already seen, when we plug in Coulomb's law for V and we solve this equation, the energies that pop out, the allowed energies that fit this equation, are exactly the Rydberg equation's energies. It's remarkable. Hundreds of years after Rydberg's empirical result, quantum mechanics validated it theoretically. The energy of the electron at this point should be fairly clear. We can kind of think of it in a rudimentary way as reflecting Coulomb's law. But what does the function psi, what does this wave function represent? What it does not represent is the position of the electron in space. That would correspond to a classical treatment, right? Classical physics was interested in understanding how the position of a particle changes with time, given the potentials and kinetic energy that it's got and all that kinds of things. Quantum mechanics throws that out and says we cannot know the specific position of, for example, an electron in space. Instead, quantum mechanics says we can only know what's called the probability amplitude of the electron over space. We can only know a probability wave for the electron. So electrons behave like waves, essentially, within atoms. It's called a probability amplitude just because the actual probability of finding an electron at a point is equal to the square of the wave function at that point. We can represent that mathematically like this. P is equal to psi squared. But in a very fundamental way, the larger psi is, the higher is the probability of finding an electron at that point in space. And psi is a function of x, y, and z. It varies over space. I know what you might be thinking. All right, why don't you go ahead and tell me? We already know what the energies look like from Rydberg's equation. What do the corresponding psi's look like? We'll get there, but we have to have a little bit more background information first about the nature of these psi's. To do that, we need to expand on this idea of quantum numbers. So we've already seen one, the principal quantum number. Remember that the principal quantum number was that n value for the electron and the hydrogen atom, and n equals 1 had the lowest energy, n equals 2 was both farther from the nucleus and at a higher energy, and as we went up, actually if you think about the way the Rydberg equation works, these energy levels get closer and closer and closer together, asymptotically approaching zero, in fact, just like what we'd expect from Coulomb's law. Within each of these energy levels, there are actually multiple wave functions 
that fit the Schrodinger equation. So for example, if we call this energy E2 up here at n equals 2, we might have psi 2 1, psi 2 2, and psi 2 3, just to use a very basic index, that all fit the Schrodinger equation. And these allowed wave functions themselves fit patterns that are reflected by other quantum numbers. So psi we can think of as a function of multiple quantum numbers other than just n. There are three more that are important for electrons in atoms. There's the orbital quantum number L, the magnetic quantum number m sub L, and the spin quantum number S or m sub S. And the quantum numbers are the parameters that we plug in to define, this should say, psi. Like we said, at a given energy level, for a given n value, we might have multiple psi's that fit the Schrodinger equation with different values, for example, for L, or different values for m sub L or S. Quantum numbers kind of define the address of the electrons, right? So we can think of, for example, the principal quantum number n as defining the city we live in, say the city of Atlanta. The orbital quantum number is like the neighborhood, it's a little more specific. The magnetic quantum number is a street within the neighborhood, and the spin quantum number is, say, the particular house within that street, within that neighborhood, within that city. And just like addresses, there are certain rules that quantum numbers must follow, right? If we fix our city as Atlanta, then we can only choose neighborhoods that are in Atlanta. We can only choose streets that are in those neighborhoods, and so on and so forth. There are rules for the quantum numbers, and here they are. As we've seen, n must be an integer greater than 0. 1, 2, 3, etc. One thing I want to impress on you is that this goes on to positive infinity. So n can take on any positive integer value. But once we've decided on a value for n, l must be less than n. So for example, if we decide on n equals 2, the only allowed values for l are 0 and 1. Once we've chosen a value for l, say l equals 1, m sub l's absolute value must be less than or equal to l. In mathematical form, m sub l's absolute value must be less than or equal to l. So for example, when l equals 1, m sub l can only be negative 1, 0, or 1. And all of these can only be integers, by the way. The spin quantum number s must be either plus 1 half or minus 1 half. Pretty straightforward. Now what you might have noticed about this quantum number model is that it almost in a way defines shells that can contain electrons. Each shell of orbitals with a common principal quantum number contains multiple, in many cases, subshells. And the number of subshells increases with n, right? Because when n equals 2, we have two values for L. When n equals 3, we have three values for L, and so on and so forth. And as L expands, the possibilities for m sub l expand. So, as n increases, in fact, the number of subshells increases as n squared. One thing that's worth noting about the orbital quantum number l is that we usually don't represent it using numbers. For historical reasons, it's usually represented using letters. So, l equals 0 is s, l equals 1 is p, l equals 2 is d, and l equals 3 is f. And these are the four most common for chemistry. Actually, now that we're filling in the bottom rows on the front tiers of the periodic table, we're starting to get into L equals 4, which is a very interesting sort of frontier kind of area, but for our purposes, we don't need to worry about L beyond 3. So remember, we saw before that as n, the principal quantum number increases, the energies of the electron increase. N equals 1, N equals 2, N equals 3. As we add the subshells into the mix, we see that different size co can correspond to the same principal quantum number, to the same energy level. For the n equals 1 level, well, the only possibility is L equals 0, s, right? And so the only possible energy level is 1s. At n equals 2, we get the 2s as well as the 3 2p orbitals, plus 1, 0, and minus 1 for m sub L, right? Within each of these levels, also, we can have a spin-up electron and a spin-down electron. And so we can fill these levels with electrons like so. You'll see orbital energy diagrams like this a lot. And actually, in one of the vid videos of this section, we're going to 
take a look at the orbital as a concept so that you can really understand what are the essential pieces of every orbital. What should you look for when it becomes apparent that orbitals are relevant to a problem or a situation?